Good morning, friends. We are very happy that you're with us today. It's June 7th, and we are glad that you chose to be with us for this time of worship. I don't know where you are, and I don't know when you're watching this, but if you're watching us on Facebook or if you're watching on YouTube, please make certain that you let us know where you're watching from. We really want to see that. I also want to remind you that one of the ways you can worship with us is through your offering. And when we gather for worship on these days, it's important for us to continue to remember the ministry and the work that we're trying to do as we go forward. You can participate with an online gift, or you can mail it in, or you can even text it. We're trying to make it as easy as possible, and you can text that to 77977, and that's Manassas Give. We have several other things I'd like for you to be aware of as we continue on with our, our announcements. One, I'd like you to be aware that small groups are meeting. You're available to join us with small groups. Go to our website and you can connect in. We've got people that are newly attending our church during this coronavirus quarantine that are plugging into our small groups. Also want to remind you that it's time for our elder nominations. And so elders are going to be, the elder process is beginning and you're going to be receiving some information about that. And so be prayerfully considering some persons you might like to nominate to serve as an elder. And with that, we have a business meeting coming up. And it's going to be a unique business meeting. It's going to be a Zoom business meeting. And so next Sunday, we are going to meet together online rather than coming in person. And we'll be hosting a business meeting on Zoom. You need to register for it, though, so that we can, uh, we can know who will be there and we can send out the proper invitations. Our nation has been dealing with a lot, of, a lot of grief and a lot of pain. Terry Johnson and the women's ministry, they put together a prayer walk, if you will. It's in our cafeteria, and there's a number of stations where you can process and think and consider some of the things that are going on in our nation. And we opened that up on Thursday. And this week... It'll be open Monday through Thursday from 11 to 1, and it'll be open Thursday evening from 5 to 7. If you'd like to just come in, pray for our nation, pray for our community, pray for each other as we process through some hard things. As we deal with that, I'd like to introduce you to a young man that just started work this week. His name is Sam Price, and Sam Price is a recent graduate of uh, Wheaton College in Chicago, Illinois. He's a, he's a native of Alexandria, and uh, we're excited to have him come on board and work with us and be a part of our student ministry, and I'm thrilled to have Sam with us, and I've asked Sam to, to start our service with a, a word of prayer. Sam, would you lead us in prayer? Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you for this time of worship. Um, I, pr I pray a blessing over Pastor David as he delivers your message Lastly, Father God, I pray for our country, our nation, and its leaders, God, that uh, as we struggle through these times of trials and troubles, um, may we go out and be your light in this world. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you. I wanted to start this morning, and I want to draw your attention to your screen, and I want you to look at the scripture. I'm going to ask from wherever you are that you read this with me this morning. 2 Chronicles 7, 14 says this. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. I know we have a lot going on right now, but the church has been called for such a time as this. We will humble ourselves, we will pray, we will seek, and we will turn. And not one of those words, humble, pray, seek, or turn, have the letter I in it because it's not about us. And if we aren't coming before the Lord each morning asking what he would have us to do versus what we would want to do in our own spirit, in our own strength, he is clear until we do that, he will not heal our land. And so this morning, I am begging, I am pleading as we come before the Lord and draw close to him, that we recognize that he is our light. He is the way maker. He is here. 
let us come before him this morning. Let us draw near to the only one, the only one who can deliver and heal this land.
the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory for the battle belongs. I know how this story is. Yes, I know how this story is. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory.
and happy June. Today we are learning about Terry Kessler. Terry helps us in the clubhouse every Sunday during small group hour where she sits on the floor with us and plays silly games. Terry is a lot of fun, right? You know this. She has been helping on D Street for almost two years. Her favorite color is forest green. Her favorite candy, Snickers and Smarties. Her favorite pizza is buffalo chicken. Terry has a Pomeranian dog named Caesar and two cats named Ladybug and Reverend. If she could do anything, she would open a no-kill animal shelter. Way to go, Terry. Last Sunday, I shared with you about my toy owl and how it didn't have any legs. Today's message is titled, True love goes forward. Susan Bailey is a lady I know from a church we attended years ago. This is a picture of her at that time with her family when she was 23 years old. A few years before I met Susan, my husband Bill gave me a giant stuffed bear for Valentine's Day. The bear was brown and fluffy. Its face had a happy grin and big eyes. In its paws, it held a heart-shaped pillow embroidered with the words, true love. The summer of 2007, Susan Bailey became extremely ill with E. coli bacteria from swimming in the James River. It was so dangerous, she almost died. She was taken by emergency helicopter to a hospital in Richmond. In order to save her life, both of her legs had to be amputated cut off below the knee. For weeks, I felt God urging me to give Susan my true love bear. I didn't want to give Susan my bear for two reasons. Number one, it was very special to me. Number two, Bill was battling cancer at that same time that Susan was fighting for her life. So I kept ignoring God's promptings, but one Sunday, as I was leaving my house to go to church, in my mind I heard, remember your bear. Crying, I said, but Lord, what if Bill dies from this cancer? Then I won't have the bear to remember him by. But I knew in my heart that I must do what God asked me to do. So I took that big brown bear to church, where all the children prayed over it. Three days later, I delivered the true love bear to Susan at the retreat hospital. Since that time, Susan has gone forward to spread the word about Jesus Christ and her miracle of surviving. The bear has also gone forward to comfort someone else in need. Susan gave the bear to Rachel, who was 13 years old at the time. Rachel was fighting leukemia, which is blood cancer. She named the bear B3, which stands for Big Brown Bear. Rachel 
endured harsh chemicals to get rid of leukemia. She was very sick and her hair fell out. After all of the cancer treatments were over, her hair grew back and she became strong again, strong enough to play on the school basketball team. God worked in her life and like Susan, she told others about God's love and her miracle of surviving. I think back on that hospital visit with Susan. As I hugged her goodbye, I looked once more at the true love bear. He sat proudly on the end of Susan's bed where her feet would have been, and he was smiling a big happy grin. 1 Corinthians 13, 7 and 8 tells us, Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. So I hope you'll remember, true love really does go forward. I miss you very much, and I hope I can see you soon. Bye. Friends, it's time in our worship where we gather to pray. And this week, we've got some things we have to pray for that are just hard. We know we're going to be addressing some difficult things in my message today as we look at our nation. You've already heard us talk about that a little bit. But our church suffered some loss this week, and we need to pray for some people who are going through some difficult times. Today, Glenna Olms is in the room with us, and she's taking notes so that she can transcribe and share with our hearing impaired friends. And her, her husband, Dan, he lost two of his siblings this week in St. Louis. I can't imagine losing two siblings in one week, and due to the quarantine and all the challenges of COVID, he's not able to be with his family, and my heart grieves, grieves for Dan. We also want to be in prayer for two families in our church that lost loved ones this week. We think it might have been COVID, and uh, we want to pray, pray for these families as they process through some very, very challenging times. We also had some very difficult news about our friend Stephanie Rowland. Stephanie Rowland is the preschool director at our church. And Stephanie, as you know, has been battling liver cancer, and she has had a, a valiant fight for the past year. Her doctor found that she has had um, some growth in her cancer, and it's spread into some other places. So she's going to be starting another round of chemotherapy that's going to be a little bit more aggressive and a little bit more difficult, and it's not going to be easy. So would you join me as we pray, pray for Stephanie? And friends, we know our hearts are heavy for the people that have lost and for the challenging news and the difficult stuff that's going on. But we also have some things to be thankful for. Two weeks ago, I shared with you about a childhood friend named Trevor Weaver who, who found out for the second time that he had, had a brain tumor. He had surgery on Friday in St. Louis, and they were able to remove all of that tumor, and I'm very thankful for that. That's good news. I also found out and we welcomed home uh, our little friend Elliot Owens, our 10-year-old buddy in our congregation who had surgery in Charlottesville. And he came home and I sent you an email and showed you just a big, beautiful smile on that little guy. We celebrate. Friends, as we look around our world, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of heartache, there's a lot of mess that is not pleasant. And in the midst of all that, don't miss God's blessings wherever they might be. They might be in a friend's good report from St. Louis. It might be in a 10-year-old boy coming home from a surgery in Charlottesville. There's going to be many other things in your life. Don't miss God's grace in this difficult season. It's there. The season's difficult. The season's hard. And we've got to press through. But don't miss God's hand in all of this. Would you join me as we pray? Father, as we gather in the name of Jesus today, we are grateful for another, another Sunday where we can come together virtually where we can gather together literally around the world, where we can gather together from across the United States, from California to Massachusetts to Maine to North Carolina, Florida, and all over Northern Virginia. Father God, we don't like being separated due to the quarantine and the isolation that we have to do. We, in fact, I hate it. But God, we are doing our best to process through it. And in the midst of all the challenges that we face and all the, all the mess that we're dealing with as a nation right now, we are reminded that you are with us, that you are walking with us, and that you constantly have a ray of hope somewhere in the darkness. And so, Father, help us to see your hand of grace, whether that's in a friend's good report in St. Louis or a little guy coming back from Charlottesville with the, after, suffer, after dealing with some major surgery. But God, we also pray for those who are, 
who are grieving. And we pray for our friend Dan Olms, and we just ask God that you would comfort him in this season of brokenness. We pray for Danny Barrett's family, and we pray for those who loved him and cared for him. And we, we pray for Rajan, and we ask God that you would give grace to his wife and others who loved him. Father, for our dear friend Stephanie, we've watched her fight for the past year dealing with the, the liver cancer. And now, Father, we have to ramp up our prayers and just ask God for your grace and mercy as we, as we begin girding up our loins to fight again, to fight alongside of her as she deals, as she deals with some cancer that spread. And we ask God that you would help her to heal, that your hand would be upon her, and that, Father, you would just give us a miracle. Father, we are grateful for our friend. And we pray, God, that you would bless her and give her your peace. Thank you for the time that we can be together today. Hear our prayer. We make it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning on that medley. The first piece that we shared with you is a different tune of In Christ There Is No East or West. It is one that is an African-American spiritual, and we wanted to share that version of the hymn with you this morning. Then we shared with you two verses of Let Your Heart Be Broken for a World in Need, a timely message for right now. 
and concluded with a verse of, we are one in the bond of love. There's no greater love than the love of our Father for us, of Jesus Christ for us, and the Spirit, our Comforter, with us. And Miriam Beecher and Mark Dodge, accompanied by Bridget Ruff on flute, come now to share with you Mark Hayes' beautiful arrangement of the song that David Haas wrote the words to and Mark wrote the music, You Are Mine. Yeah. 
right, friends, it's time in our worship time when we gather to, to break the bread of life and to get into the Word. And if you have your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to open them up to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, we're going to be looking at Pentecost. And I know last Sunday was Pentecost, and we are going to be talking about that today. In light of the last several weeks, we've been dealing with a message series called Going From Surviving to Thriving. And today we're going to deviate from that for just a bit. I was planning to interview two nurses in our congregation to talk about what they have been doing in caring for those who have been suffering with COVID and, and how we can survive, go move from surviving to thriving and how we care for others. But in light of everything that's been taking place in our nation, I felt it was important that we deviate from that a bit and we go in another direction. Next Sunday, we're going to return to uh, moving from surviving to thriving, and we're going to be dealing with some of our high school students who are graduating, and well, in the following week on Father's Day, we're going to be interviewing John Dunn as he's going to conclude, help us conclude our message series on moving from surviving to thriving. A couple of years ago, in our men's group, we were talking about the importance of, of revisiting what it looks like to, to worship, to fellowship to grow in discipleship, to minister, and to share our faith story. And Dan Doherty, who is a, a part of our men's group, he is a retired brigadier general. And he said something in our, in our group that I thought was very important, and I've, I've, never, I've never forgotten, and I don't think I will. He said that in the course of his military career, he said it was so important and so vital to go on and continually train soldiers about what it means to, to operate in a military capacity, to move in sequence, to move in the order in which they need to move. He said it's fascinating that if you take 40 guys and you train them for six months and then you just stop training them, they very quickly become 40 guys running around with guns. He said you constantly have to train and teach and help them do and know what to do, what is right, in that whatever capacity they're engaged. And then he said... And the same thing is true for the church. We constantly have to revisit the importance of worship, of fellowship, of discipleship, of sharing our faith story, of ministry. And he said, because we, if we don't constantly revisit this, we sometimes lose what our purpose is. You've heard me talk a lot in the last four and a half years that I've been here as a pastor about race. You've heard me talk a lot about the importance of our congregation's diversity. You've heard me talk a lot about one of the most beautiful things in this congregation is the fact that people from all over the world come here and serve here and worship here and lead here and do all the things that we do. And friends, like Dan Doherty said, we have to revisit those things on occasion. We have to revisit those ideas and those images and that, that passion every now and then. And right now, it's a very important time for us to revisit this and to reflect on what that means, what's going on in our nation, and how we, as the body of Christ that meets at Manassas Baptist Church, how we might impact this. We've watched over the past couple of days the, the, the riots that have been taking place. We've seen protests take place. We've seen the, the images of, of Mr. Floyd dying so many times. And we've watched our country get torn asunder, and we've seen people say things and do things, and it's, it has been a heart-rending past couple of weeks. And I wonder, what is the church, our church and churches like us, like ours all over the country, what are we doing to bring about healing, to be, a, be the light of Christ and to make a difference in the world? What are we saying? How are we reflecting something better? How are we reflecting something that Jesus would have us reflect? And that's vitally important. I believe Jesus said that the body of Christ is the light of the world. And what are we shining right now? How are we shining in this challenging season? This week I spent a lot of time in a, in a vet's hospital. And in the course of being in that vet's hospital, I was having conversations with various persons that were there and whatnot. And I had to drop off my dog and get back to the church because I was going to interview uh, Reverend Grady Powell of in, on Wednesday night. And I told the young lady that I was going to get ready to interview Reverend Powell and of what was going on and that I was the pastor of a church and I wanted to talk about how Reverend Powell had marched with Martin Luther King back in 1965. And she immediately spoke up and she said, oh, good. She said, I'm so glad that you all are involved. She said, on Sunday night when I was at Liberia and I was in the protest, I saw all the pastors and the clergy persons who were there. And she said, and it made me feel good. 
And so, friends, I, I wonder, what in the world do we need to do as Manassas Baptist Church, as individuals who are part of this community of faith, what is the next step that we need to do? Is there a next step that we need to be involved? The sad reality is, churches have not dealt with this well through the years. We just haven't. We have not dealt with this well through the years. We, we can talk about very quickly and clearly churches that would not allow people of color to come in their doors. They would stand at the door and not allow them to come in. We can talk about very clearly churches that shut down ministries because minorities started coming to their church. We can talk about very clearly churches that would rather close their doors than allow a changing neighborhood to be engaged. We can talk about all too clearly people who have not been treated right or well because they spoke a different language, because their dress was different, because of whatever the difference was. There's a lot of very sad and negative history in the church's life that we have to address and recognize in our story. Doesn't necessarily mean that's our story, Manassas Baptist, but that is a part of our collective story in this journey of following Christ in the United States. It just is. Now, we are people of the book. We are people of hope. We are people of faith. We are people of the way. And for us, when we hold on to the Word of God and we build our lives on this, we seem to think that this is vitally important. And when we start looking back at what the Bible has said and how the Bible has addressed the issue of race and dealing with people who are different, we have to understand that all the way back to the very beginning in the book of Exodus, Moses commanded us and he challenged us in Exodus chapter 22 and verse 21, do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner, for you were foreigners in Egypt. Don't do it. Don't mistreat a person who's different than you. In the book of the law, in the book of Leviticus, in Leviticus chapter 19, the Bible reads, When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as you love yourself. For you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Friends, our history, our, our foundation, our, our Judaic roots, that's who we are. The prophet Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah wrote this in Isaiah 56. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to Him. Foreigners who love the name of the Lord and are His servants. All who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and hold fast to my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain, and I will give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Friends, in the, in the Old Testament world, our Jewish friends, they lived a different life. Their life was different but in terms of their covenant sign in the, in the circumcision. Their lives were different in terms of how they responded to their God. They didn't work on the Sabbath, and that was totally different. They didn't eat certain things, and that was different in that culture of that day. They treated people in a different way that, that was happening in that world, and their lifestyle was totally different. When you look at the Old Testament image, and you see it from the Exodus or the Leviticus, and you can see it throughout the rest of the Old Testament, and ultimately in Isaiah, you can see that when people who came from other places whether it was Edom or Moab or Mesopotamia or Egypt or Cush or Libya or wherever, and they were impacted, their culture was different, their language was different, their diet was different, but they were called to respect them and love them and care for them. That's the message. And then we get Jesus, and we get this message in the New Testament, and we see what Jesus said in John. He said very clearly, that people will know you are my disciples if you love one another. We look very clearly at the most memorized verse in the entire scripture in John 3.16. For God so loved the world. Everyone. That's the message that we have from Jesus is this idea of loving others. Jesus 
He opened the door as wide as you possibly could in opening the door to people who are different than the Jewish community. And that same message is conveyed to us in this 21st century world when Jesus, in that New Testament message, He opened the door to the Samaritan woman and to the Samaritans. Jesus, He opened the door to the Decapolis and people who were not Jewish and embraced them. Jesus, He opened the door to Romans who were in control of Israel. Jesus, He told us the story of the Good Samaritan and reminds us that our call is to love our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus, when he is asked to summarize the entirety of the law, he says, love God and love your neighbor. The vertical and the horizontal. That is Jesus' story. That is what Jesus calls us to do. And as we look at the story of our nation right now, and as we look at the challenges that are happening right now, as we look at the sadness, and we look at riots, and we look at destruction, and we look at brutality, and we look at other things that are going on, the church, this body of Christ, the body of Christ that's across the street, the body of Christ that's down the street, the body of Christ that meets all over this world, we have a message that has to be shared as we try to shine the light that is desperately needed to be seen. And that light is loving your neighbor as yourself. The church, well, it kind of got its start in Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 2, Jesus, he promised the Holy Spirit that would come. And in Acts chapter 2, we, we see this take place. And I, I'm not going to read the entire chapter. I'm going to start with just Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were suddenly, they were together in one place. And suddenly, a sound came of blowing violent wind from the heavens, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because they, each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not these men Galileans? How is it that each of us hears them in our own language? Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We all hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue and amazed and perplexed. They ask one another, what does this mean? And that very first experience of Pentecost, you can see an, am an amazing, miraculous event with the, with the gift of tongues and the speaking of the languages that are coming forth. Right after that, the Apostle Peter, he, he preaches the very first message, and when he preaches this message for the church, over 3,000 people come to faith. A little bit later, it describes what's taking place in the church and how the church is coming together and the church is sharing with one another. The church is sharing their faith story. The church is gathering for worship. The church is caring for their neighbors. And people are being added to the community of faith daily. It says that that church enjoyed the favor of all people because it was doing what it needed to do in loving God in loving others. And we see this image taking place, and it's, an, it's a powerful, powerful image. We read this, and I, I don't know about you, but there are times when I'm reading the Bible, and I start reading names in the Bible, and I don't understand the names, and I don't connect with the names. And, and when I'm reading through the book of Chronicles, and there's just page after page of names, I kind of skip all those names, because they just don't mean anything to me. And when you read Acts chapter 2, and you start reading some of these nations that are represented... Guys, we aren't familiar with some of those nations, so I, I started looking it up, and when we see the Parthenians, the Parthenians are from Algeria. They're from Northwest Africa. The Medes, those are people from Iran. When we see the Elamites, they're from Kurdistan. When we see the people from Mesopotamia, those are people from modern-day Iraq and modern-day Kuwait. When we see the people from Cappadocia, Pontus, Phrygia, Pamphylia, those are different nations that were in the, the country of Turkey. And then we see the land of Egypt, which we're familiar with, Libya, which we're familiar with, Rome, and Crete. 
as the church got its start, as the church got its start, it was filled with people from all over the world. They were Jewish people from all over the world, but they were people from all over the world. And they were hearing the story of Jesus in their own language from the very beginning. The church looked like this world of ours. They were different. And that message that goes out from every tribe and every nation and every tongue that we see in Acts chapter 2 is also seen in the book of Revelation when we are introduced with what John says about the Revelation in Revelation chapter 7. After I looked out and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from every tribe, people and language standing before, and before the throne and before the Lamb and they were wearing white robes and they were holding palm branches in their hands. From the very beginning until the very end, that's the picture of the body of Christ. Everyone, everywhere, welcome. Did the church always get it right? No. Did the church always do it perfect? No. Did the church always get it all squared away? No. Even the apostle Peter got turned sideways on the issue of welcoming Gentiles into the church, and the apostle Paul had to spank him hard. Friends, the reality is, this is hard. It's not easy. But it is the image that God has for all of us. In the book of Galatians, the Bible reads, Therefore there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. The image that we have as the body of Christ today is an image that is to be reflected by the diversity of people around us. That is our call. That's the image we have. The church in the first century world, it came together across socioeconomic levels. There were people who were very wealthy, and then there were the poorest slaves. There were people who were connected politically with Rome, and then again, there were the poorest slaves. There were men in leadership, there were women in leadership, there were people from all over the world that came together, and they were a part of the body of Christ in leadership, in service, and working together. That is our story. And we have done it well, and we have messed it up for the last 2,000 years. And right now, our nation is dealing with some bad stuff. And I believe that it's the opportunity for the body of Christ to stand up and do some things, whatever those things are, to make things better. Now, I wish I could give you point A, point B, point C, point D, and say this is what you're going to do. I'm trying to figure out what I can do, let alone what you can do. I don't know what I'm going to do. I wish I did. One of the things that I tried to, tried to do this week was just to sit down with my friend Reverend Grady Powell and interview him and just get that conversation started. What can I do? And Reverend Powell and I'm going to go through this in my points here in just a minute. He said, just do something good. So if you don't hear anything else that I'm going to say, I'm going to quote a lot from Reverend Powell here in just a few moments. Just do one thing that's good and build on that. Reverend Powell, he attends our church twice a month with his son, Grady. Reverend Powell is a retired pastor from Petersburg, Virginia. He served Guilfield Baptist Church from... From 1962 until for 37 years, you do the math. And he was a very gifted leader, and he made a huge impact in the community of Petersburg. 1965, he marched with Dr. Martin Luther King in Montgomery. He served as a helping people get registered to vote. He was on the buses to desegregate our bus lines. He, he has been a giant in the civil rights movement, and he attends our church. He and his wife attend our church twice a month where their son Grady is a deacon and they go to First Baptist Manasseh twice a month because that's where their daughter attends services. So we have the opportunity to engage with this gentle giant and this man of faith who's been through some very difficult things and when I had the opportunity to talk to him and share with him and be a part of his story, 
I wanted him to be able to share with us some things that we might be able to do. And the first thing Dr. Powell said to me, he said this. I'm going to give you six. The first one is this. Do the good things that aren't so difficult. Do the good things that aren't so difficult. In our congregation, we have people from 52 nations that worship here. Maybe one of the good things that you can do that isn't so difficult is actually get to know somebody from somewhere else. Maybe one of the things that you can do is serve with somebody who's from somewhere else. Maybe one of the things that you can do is join tables of eight and that Tom and Linda Supan so faithfully lead and get to know people who are from other parts of the world. People who are, from, who are different from you. Building some relationships. Do the things that aren't so good. One of the things that Reverend Powell told me the other day is that when he was in high school, I think he was 17 or 16 or 17, he said it was the first time, the story that he told, it was the first time that he heard a white adult call an African-American man Mr., and then he called his last name. He said white folks never called a black man Mr. It just didn't happen. Maybe one of the good things that we can do today is when we're encountering people or going through the line wherever, we're engaged with people in the normal course of life, look people in the eyes, see who they are as individuals, and speak to them. Acknowledge their humanity. You don't have to solve their issues. You don't have to solve their problem, but just see them as a person, not as a threat, not as a challenge, but simply see them as a person. Do the good things that aren't so difficult. Get to know people. Just simply get to know a person that's different from you. The second thing that we talk about is is simply educating ourselves. We talk about Black Lives Matter and we get kind of nervous because what does that really mean? And people say some different things. Maybe one of the things that we need to do is educate ourselves. You've heard me say if you've listened to me preach, that I grew up in a sundown town. And a sundown town in southern Illinois, I thought my town was unique, but a sundown town was a town that by written law or unwritten law would not allow minorities to live there. I found this book. It's called Sundown Towns, and it was written by James Lowen. And he went, goes through and he researches the number of sundown towns, not just in Illinois, But in Indiana, in Missouri, in Iowa, in Minnesota, in Michigan, in Ohio, in New York, in New Jersey, in Connecticut, in Maine, in Massachusetts. Now, if you noticed, I didn't name one southern state because sundown towns were almost exclusively in the north. And he goes through and he identifies sundown town after sundown town. I thought my town was unique. Turns out there are over 600 sundown towns in Illinois. There's another six or 700 in Indiana. There's about 400 in Iowa. There was an equal number in Minnesota and Michigan. It was prevalent throughout the North. And understanding how that happened and why that happened is an education that we need to avail ourselves to learn a little bit about. Another pastor, another book that you might want to look at. I don't have a copy of it. I read it on my my Kindle. It's, It's called The Cross... And the lynching tree, the cross and the lynching tree, it's written by Reverend James Cohn, and he addresses the, 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 the period of time in our nation from 1860, 68, I think is the first lynching, until 1968, a hundred years when lynching was taking place in our nation. We know there were 3,400 plus African Americans who were lynched in our nation. There were probably many others, but those are the ones we know about. And you read that story, and it's an education that's painful, and it's hard, but it's one we need to learn about. D. Witten from North Star, he encouraged a group of pastors to meet together, and we read a book called The Trouble I've Seen, Changing the Way the Church Deals with Racism by Drew Hart. And it addresses what's happened within the body of Christ in more recent years. And friends, one of the things that we might need to do is simply educate ourselves about some of the challenges that have been going on in our nation that maybe we've ignored because it doesn't affect us. And the reality is, 
the body of Christ has to recognize that if it affects our brother, then we need to address it and we need to learn something about it. The third thing that I think we need to think about, I think we need to practice, is to simply have a conversation. Have a conversation. This week, D. Witten put together a, a group of pastors for the North Star Network, and I guess there were 45 pastors in a Zoom call. And in the Zoom call, an African-American pastor in Fairfax, his name is Marshall Asbury, he pastors Fairfax Station Baptist Church, he, he talked about some practical things that we could do. And when he finished, after however many minutes he presented, D. said, are there any other African-American pastors that would like to speak about this, their experience? And a fellow by the name of Sam, he's a retired FBI agent. He lives in Loudoun County, Virginia. He spoke up and he said, with his voice quivering, he said, D, I'm retired from the FBI. I wore a gun. I carried a badge. I wore a badge and I carried a gun. I could go all over the United States. I could defend myself. I could defend others. He said, but I could not defend my children from racism in Lamb County. He started crying when he started saying this, but his 13-year-old son was at a football game in Loudoun County, and the police were looking for an African-American man who had robbed somewhere. And as they were looking for that man, they grabbed his 13-year-old son, threw him on the ground, and put their knee in his neck and held him in front of all of his friends while they were determining who this kid was, 13-year-old boy. And Sam Femester said, I could defend other people. I could defend my nation, but I couldn't defend my own son. In that same community, his little boy, eight years old, is at a Christian school. And at that Christian school, he is asked a question about a slave. And when he answers differently than what the teacher expected, he had the answer the teacher didn't. The teacher sent him to the principal for being rude and arrogant. And the little guy was going to get corporal punishment for being rude and arrogant. And so they called Sam. and He came back from wherever his office was. And he got to that principal's office and the principal explained everything. And the FBI agent said, sir, you realize my son is right. And the principal said, yes, but he was rude and disrespectful. So he's going to get corporal punishment right now. And Mr. Femester said, I just need you to understand something. Every time you hit my son, I'm going to hit you. And that principal didn't strike his son, and they removed that boy from that class. And Sam's crying at this point in front of 40-plus pastors. And I don't know how you even process that. So I picked up the phone when our meeting was over, and I called Sam. I don't know Sam. I've never met Sam. And I said to him, I said, thank you for sharing your story. We need to hear that. And in the course of the conversation, we talked about different things that had happened. And he thanked me. And he said, Reverend Donahue, you need to know something. He said, you're only the third person that's ever asked me about this. You're only the third person. Thank you for calling me and asking about this. Another pastor. I'm only going to tell you two. Another pastor is a pastor in Alexandria, Virginia. His first name is Jeff. Jeff told the story that when he was a part of the integration of a school in Alexandria, he was a little boy. And as little boys and little girls want to do, he wanted to play a game during recess. And some of the kids were sitting on the floor and they were playing Monopoly. And he sat down with the kids and said, can I play this game with you? And he said one of the little boys stood up and kicked him in the forehead. He fell back, and he went to the teacher, and he told the teacher what had happened. And the teacher said, Jeff, sit at your desk, put your head down. And nothing happened to the boy that kicked him. He told me, he said, I'm 58 years old. And he said, I very rarely told that story. He said, because I can still feel the pain and the embarrassment of what happened at that moment. And I chatted with him about that story. And when we got finished... He said the same thing to me that Sam Femester said. He said, Reverend Donahue, he said, you're one of very few people that have ever called to talk to me 
about this. I have never met that pastor before, just on the Zoom call. So friends, maybe we need to be gentle, and we need to be smart, and we need to be kind, and we need to have some conversations that are hard. And maybe that's something you can do to help bridge some gaps that are going on. A third thing, excuse me, a fourth thing that we might need to think about in the season that we're in is to simply have hope. Have hope that it will be better. When I was chatting with Reverend Powell, he told me that he had a teacher that taught him two very important things. He said, I could be better and tomorrow will be be better. He said, I could improve and tomorrow can improve. And when we talked about what that looked like through all the mess that he experienced in his life, he said, Pastor, I always had hope that tomorrow would be better. And one of the pieces that we need to have for our nation and for what's happening around us is to have the hope that things will get better. Does it mean it's going to be easy? No. I asked him what it was like when Dr. Martin Luther King was killed in 1968. And he said, Pastor David, he said, I felt like America had hit a wall and I didn't think there was any way we were ever going get, to get over that. But that's when my faith kicked in and I had to keep pressing. And guys, right now we're watching things that we haven't seen since 1968. And now's when we've got to have hope and our faith has got to kick in and we've got to stand up and speak out and do whatever it is that we've got to do. But part of it is simply having hope that things can change. Things can change if we will get involved and get involved to make things a little bit better around us. I believe we want to see that happen. But we've got to have the hope. The fifth thing that I think Mr. Powell said to me that I think is vitally important is simply do something. Do something. I can't tell you what that's going to be for you. For me, it was starting the interview process with Reverend Powell and just getting that conversation out there. Since our interview on Wednesday night, over 1,600 people have watched that interview, and he's astonished that that many people have responded. We've had over 400 comments and messages go back and forth about, about his story and his interview, and it's, it's simply amazing to watch the response that people have had. Do something. For me, it was an interview, and I don't know what my next thing's going to be, but it's something. For others, it might be repentance. Did you watch Roger Goodall from the NFL? He got on video yesterday and said, we were wrong about Colin Kaepernick. We were wrong. We shouldn't have stopped that. We shouldn't have done what we did there. Maybe it's simply acknowledging that we've done some things that are wrong. Maybe part of what we need to do is repentance. Maybe we have said things and we've had attitudes or we've told jokes or we've had a mindset that we need to repent from. Guys, that's a big thing that we need to consider. If that's a part of your story, there might be some repentance that we need to address. Maybe we need to be like Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan just pledged one hundred million dollars. Now, he's got the money to spare. He's a billionaire, but he just pledged a hundred million dollars to address this. And when he made that pledge, this is what he said. We must listen to each other. We must show compassion and empathy and never turn our backs on senseless brutality. We need to continue peaceful expressions against injustice and demand accountability. I don't think anybody can do a hundred million dollars, but I know we can do something I know we can get involved in some capacity in some way. Friends, what is it for you? Do something. Do something to express this. And the final piece that Reverend Powell shared with me that I think is so important is to simply have faith in tomorrow. Have faith in tomorrow. In Reverend Powell's book, he tells the story of his brother coming home from, from Navy and he's getting ready to get, get married while he's on leave. And he went to the local grocery store to see some friends. And while he was there, a, a white man came in and, and shot at another man and killed his brother on accident. When his brother died, his father went to a lawyer to, to try and get some justice. But he said not once did a police officer, a deputy, a sheriff, or an investigator come to our house and talk to our family about my brother's murder. Not once. He said, have faith in tomorrow. And he told me, 
He said, Pastor David, it is different now than when it was when I was doing civil rights in the early 60s. He says, it's not good, but it's different now. And he spoke about police chiefs and police leaders who have marched with the protesters. And he talked about preacher, excuse me, he talked about police officers who have prayed with the protesters. And he's talked about the difference of things that are taking place. And he wrote, he told me this. He said, it is far from being right, but I live in the faith that what is going to be will be much better. We have to have faith that there can be some change and some transformation. And I think the church has to lead the way. And I think the church has to be involved. You see, the body of Christ, our message is hope. Our message is perseverance. Our message is change. Our message is transformation. Our message is redemption. And how do we go about that? Well, maybe we need to go about it by doing the small good things. Maybe by educating ourselves, having a conversation hoping for tomorrow that tomorrow would be better, to do something and have faith that God will see this through. When we look in Acts chapter 2, and we see the Spirit of God blowing through that area, and people from all over the world hearing the message of Christ proclaimed, we understand that God can do amazing things. And as the body of Christ that believes that, it's our opportunity to step out in faith and be that, As we go forth, sharing our faith story, sharing love for our neighbor, sharing this message of hope that Jesus provides, it's not going to be easy. There's challenges, and it's going to push you politically, and it's going to make you uncomfortable. But friends, we have to get uncomfortable and address this. Guys, as we look around, the message of Jesus remains. And Jesus doesn't want us just to sit back ignoring stuff. He wants us involved. And the question that we all have to answer is, what's our involvement going to be? What are we going to do? What is that for you? Would you pray with me? Father, we are grateful for the opportunity we have to gather in the name of Jesus. We are grateful, God, for the story that you have given us from the exodus to love others. We are grateful, Father, for the story that you've given us from your son, Jesus, to love the world. We are grateful, Father God, from the story of the church as its foundation in Acts chapter 2, when the Spirit came and people from all over the world heard the gospel of Jesus in their own language. We are grateful, Father, that that first century church That when it was doing its thing and doing its story, that there was neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male or female, but Christ was in all. Friends, Father, Father, help us. Help us as our nation struggles with this issue. That the church, those who follow Christ, those who follow Jesus, might be the light that people need to see. Help us, Father, to refine our voice so that we speak out about injustice and we offer hope and we have the faith that change can happen. Father, give us the strength we need to make the change that is desperately needed. Speak to our hearts, Father. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.